I want to start from the fact that uh, we've been going through in the last few months very exciting times. We had um, one big news in March when AlphaGo, a computer that's been trained with loads of information on Go. Go is a very traditional uh, uh, Asian Chinese game. And AlphaGo, uh, developed by DeepBrain, so it's a division in Google, um, was uh, built using neural network layers and then trained uh, with loads and loads of information uh, and uh, play a scheme. And this year, a few months ago, uh, it went uh, four to one against the legendary Lee Sedol, a Korean uh, uh, gamer. And uh, what's new about this news? The fact that AlphaGo has developed a sort of a creative way of playing moves at Go. Go is a very complex uh, uh, game, much more complex, so the experts say, than chess. And, uh, uh, and yet, most really big players win by intuition, by creative moves, not so much by reasoning. So the fact that this computer basically won showing a creativity in the move was kind of a, a breakthrough. So, Lots of breakthrough, lots of uh, tools that are also being announced, coming into our daily life. Uh, personal assistant that are embedded in smartphones, personal assistant at home. Uh, the Alexa and Heiko, actually recently, only a few days ago, the Amazon device has been uh, uh, announced to get an Italian version as well. IBM Watson with a cognitive learning uh, platform, self-driving cars, and so on. So lots of ex excitement about the possibility of having these applications. Some of them are narrow AI, some of them are deep AI. I don't go technical. We have uh, a scientist uh, soon after. She will, she will be much more uh, detailed and technical about that. What I think is very interesting from the point of view of the interface between uh, the technology development and society is the fact that we are raising lots of expectation. We are seeing many opportunities and raising a lot of hype, which has generated also lots of discussion. And as it happened in science for the last 50 or 60 years, any time we have a breakthrough technology, we have a polarization of positions. So we have people who are highly concerned about the outcomes, the impacts on society, and people who are absolutely enthusiast. There is a very strong polarization between these two positions. There is a lot of thought also in the middle, of course. But I just want to take two quotes from Nick Bostrom. He's a philosopher who spoke at TED uh, last year, and uh, raising a lot of issues about how we can control intelligent machine and the fact that machine intelligence is the last invention that humanity will ever need to make. And if you create a really powerful optimization process to maximize for a certain objective, you better make sure that your definition of that objective incorporates everything you care about. So lots of questions about the phase, not so much the technological issue of developing an intelligent machine, but the phase of what is the training and what we put into those machines. What kind of training should we go through to actually get this machine to respond to the expectation we really want? There is also a very dominant narrative at the moment about the fact that some of these application, as I say, deep AI or narrow AI can solve really complex problems which we haven't been able to solve at the moment. So problems which are um, really having a huge impact on human, uh, um, on human life, like health problems, environmental problems, climate change, for example, and so on. So I want to step back for a second and say um, I'm kind of becoming skeptical about the narratives that are too enthusiastic, as much as I am skeptical of the ones who are too critical, of course. And I like to stay very much more in, in the idea of keeping the questions very open. Science history and the development of science in the 20th century has really taught us to have this kind of more um, careful um, attitude when we think that a certain technology will change our life forever and we s will solve certain problems that we think now need to be solved. I just want to give two examples. The development of atomic energy 
was considered an amazing breakthrough, and it, it, it was an amazing breakthrough. I mean, for the first time in our history as humanity, we developed a, a weapon that can actually destruct completely our planet, can completely destroy our life, right? Now, this was the result of a secret project where thousands and thousands of scientists uh, worked for years, the, the so-called Manhattan Project, and the public discussion about the implications started only later on from the 1560s on, trying to open up the reflection on what kind of beneficial effect could come out from nuclear uh, energy and nuclear development. I mean, we're still discussing about that. If you think of the geopolitics at the moment, I mean, all the um, equilibrium and the balance between countries uh, who are deemed safe in terms of keeping uh, nuclear power and countries that we are not trusting uh, having a nuclear weapon. Uh, a bit more uh, immediate was the discussion about the biotechnology breakthrough. I am a biotechnologist by training. I'm, I, I really remember the hype, not in the 70s because I was a child, but a few years later about the idea that biotechnology could change our life dramatically for good because it could solve all the problems related to big disease, for example. We could have personalized medicine uh, giving us treatment for the, more than the most serious disease. Now, why scientists? Here we have James Watson. Sorry, uh, it's very important so to point out uh, Alfred Einstein and Leo Zillard, the two scientists who are actually very doubtful about the use of the nuclear bomb. So there was an internal discussion at that time, which wasn't made public, though. And a bit more public was the situation regarding biotechnology. And here we have James Watson, Nobel Prize for discovering the DNA structure. And James Watson and other people gathered in California in 1975. And that's like the Asilo Mark Congress has remained a sort of a milestone for developing a model of discussion within the, the scientific community about putting uh, limits uh, deciding which guidelines to put down to actually make sure that the technology was applied for the good of humanity. Something similar is happening in, in the field of artificial intelligence. Loads of meetings have been held. Um, just a few days ago came out this report from Stanford, 100 years studying artificial intelligence. This is actually a very long-term project. Uh, basically, a very broad community of experts will uh, gather every four or five years to review the results, so the advancement in the science of artificial intelligence, but also the impacts, also the um, societal and economic and so on, uh, engagement impacts. Um, and this is actually, it's just really anecdotal, but it also coming from a congress that was held a couple of years ago in Asilomar again. So Asilomar is a very important place for the reflection on uh, science and its impact. Now, Open questions. Uh, okay, we are raising lots of expectation, but there are some key points of the whole process of developing intelligence machines, which I think are still really there for an open discussion. The first thing is, who are the experts, or basically, who are the trainers? We are the people we are charging with the responsibility to train these machines. At the moment, mainly scientists, mainly engineers, mainly people with very high level of education. I come back from a question that Paolo was making this morning when we started. It's important to raise the level of education. I totally agree with that. I mean, obviously, it's something I really hope it will become more and more a paradigm, especially in this country where the, the level of scientific education is not that high. That being said, if we think that scientists are the most rational People, we still have to think that our way of taking a decision and of processing a problem, it's still implying some sort of irrationality. I mean, I'm not going back to this because all the speakers treated this point. But one of the first recognition of this big assumption was the Nobel Prize in Economics given for the first time to a non-economist, which was Daniel Kahneman and this is uh, Israeli um, cognitive psychologist. He was the first one to show with his work and his approach, very experimental, very um, concrete approach, the fact that even the most rational, educated human being still has some sort of irrational response when put in a condition of uncertainty. So our response is never fully rational. That was applied to economics, but we can say it's applied basically to most fields. 
And also, if we really want, or if this, the idea is that we want to create machines that don't have the same bias we have when we deal with facts and data, and then have to give us a, the most plausible solution from, uh, uh, from the analysis of data, then a very rational approach. We, do we really want that? I don't know if you know that Enrico Fermi, one of the best scientists Italy had, was the leader of the Manhattan Project, one of the leaders. He was also one of the few scientists who really pushed forward Harry Truman to launch the bomb on Hiroshima, when other scientists were saying, OK, we can put it as a demon demonstrative sort of uh, event in, uh, in the Pacific Ocean. We don't need to kill 200,000 people. And Enrico Fermi said, no, because I want to see if all of our calculations are correct. OK? So that was a very strongly rational approach. He wanted to see the results of years and years of scientific development. Also depends on who are, who are the trainers and in which context the trainer work. Very recently, the Bloomberg wrote an article on that. Uh, the Chinese government give, gave to the military contractor, China Electronics Technology Group, the task to develop a system based on facial recognition and machine learning and so going into, let's say, an artificial intelligence system to predict upcoming activities in social security uh, framework. Basically, to monitor most citizens, to make sure that you can actually prevent what is called crime. Now, what crime is in the Chinese context doesn't necessarily is the same definition of a crime we have, right? So it's also important to see really what the input is and where it comes from. Then we go to the output. Are we ready to cope with an output that comes from a massive analysis of huge amount of data coming up with the most rational outcome? How do we cope with data? Okay, again, today we had lots of input on that side, so I won't go on the psychology, although from the science point of view, it's very interesting because for the last 30, 40 years, one of the major gap of um, relationship between science and society is the assumption from the scientific community that if you er enhance the level of education, people will be more prone to actually accept risk. So to accept technology that are perceived at risk. But all the studies in neuroscience contradict completely this assumption and show that even highly educated people really always have some sort of mechanism, like the anchoring and adjustment mechanism or other type of shortcut that make our response linked not only to rational analysis, but also to our values and our uh, innate sort of uh, um, set of values. I just want to tell you a very brief story here. Um, years ago, I was training scientists, mathematics and physics in three different locations in Italy. I gave them a set of, uh, uh, it was a, a role play game, and I asked them to allocate resources for uh, allowing people to have kids with the uh, artificial or the in vitro fertilization techniques. And they had to choose which people they would put the resource on. Now, all of these scientists, uh, voted against the idea of having homogenitorial families. Most of them, okay? They were saying, oh, you know, they were taking their decision based on philosophical, religious, uh, religions, and all of the, this kind of set of values. None of them asked if there were studies, and there are 30 years of studies of that, showing that there is no difference for the benefit or the health of a child growing in a homogenitorial family or a heterogenitorial family, okay? None of them appeal to data and to science to actually take that decision. So that's very interesting. Now, there are lots of these kind of big, complex uh, uh, situations where we already have loads of data and loads of data used to actually propose solutions that we are not really that able to cope with. A very good example is vaccine, vaccination. We know that uh, preventable diseases are preventable by means of vaccination. We have tons of data on that. This is a map that is the, it's usually an animation and shows very clearly that you could really, all of these epidemics that are shown as bubbles here are epidemics of preventable disease 
prevented, preventable by means of vaccination. Now, in Italy, in the UK, in the US, and in many other uh, Western countries, we're seeing a very strong reaction, a very strong growth of a movement of anti-vaccine. What was the fact that actually elicited this kind of response? This fact. Okay, this doctor, Andrew Wakefield, back in 1998, published a scientific paper in The Lancet, it's a very important journal in the medical community, studying a really less than 20 cases, less than 20 kids, where he said that there was an association between this kid having autism and being vaccinated. Now, since 1998, this paper has been retracted. The doctor has been uh, radiated by uh, the official uh, uh, medical, exactly, phys uh, physicians' uh, um, association. He's been completely falsified. I mean, it's clear that this kind of work has no scientific base, but it's still... It's still named, there is also a movie that has been uh, in the last year uh, done, which is Waxed, and uh, it's really a movie that's been promoted by the anti-vaccination uh, people. And it's still, this fact has elicited the, such a strong perception in people that still we're not able to cope with this, uh, with this situation. I just want to make another example, I still have three minutes. Sorry, I deal a lot with the seismic risk prevention and seismic risk education. There is a picture that the widow showed before. This is the highly uh, seismic countries, we know that. You see, these two buildings are two schools. The difference is that the school and the bottom part is a school that uh, collapsed uh, in 2002, is the school in San Giuliano di Puglia, killed 27 children. This school had been inaugurated five weeks before the school started, okay? Five weeks before the earthquake, okay? And because of that collapse, which was completely, I mean, there was like all the, the um, restoration had been done in a completely wrong way. There are lots of data have been produced and lots of guidelines, laws, and uh, uh, models of uh, provision and all of that to deal with seismic risk. And yet, that's the school that we had this summer in Amatrice that collapsed again. So. We have done not one step forward globally as a country. I'm not taking at the local level. Lots of things have been done at local level, but we haven't really been able to devise a serious risk prevention attitude, plan, policy, given the fact that we have tons of data on that. Okay, this is my favorite example. I work a lot on agriculture. So Back in the 60s was the first time when the world realized that we had a problem with hunger, that we had lots of people who were undernourished. So the solution at that time seemed to enhance production by using high-tech. At that time, we're not talking about biotech, but high-tech uh, varieties. And so that was the basis of the Green Revolution. We are 50 years later, and the impact, according to FAO, so FAO data is definitely the most reliable in this field, is that basically we have lost 75% of plant genetic diversity on the planet, that at the moment, 75% of the world food is generated from only 12 plants and five animal species. But have we saved all the world population from hunger? No, we still have one billion people that are completely undernourished. And we are looking and facing a huge, like a huge, a bigger problem in the, in the sense that by 2050, we probably will be 9 billion people. So what's the solution? Obviously, the problem here are not high yields, are not only high yield. It's not only food production. We know that by now. We know that the major problem are access to food, distribution, market, investment, education, and so on. OK, so the solution that's been proposed strongly in the last year or two is going stronger towards smart agriculture. So combining a model that takes all data, integrates the data, and makes the agriculture re, uh, re um, resemble more and more what a factory is. This is actually an extract from an article that came out from Technology Quarterly on The Economist last summer. And I was really stunned by f the fact that in 2016, we're still reading Something like uh, farms uh, are becoming more like factories. Uh, Tightly control operation for turning out reliable products immune as far as possible from the vagaries of nature. So all the complexity of the issue of how to feed 
billions of people and how to deal with a planet that's characterized by such a huge amount of diversity of climates, of soils and so on, is reduced to one model, which is making um, a smart agriculture model becoming widespread everywhere. It's a kind of a reduction in the process, although it's based on the use of data and smart tools. Uh, I leave it very open because I am very critical of that one approach solves every type of problem. I think we should really keep it much more open. And I will just go to the last slide, which has to do with the major issue we're dealing with today, which is climate change and the response we should give globally to climate change um, adaptation, uh, mitigation, and so on. In this case, I know I'm over time, so sorry, I will just close now, but in this case, the scientific community has really worked for the last 30 years, since the 70s, warning policymakers, institutions, public, about the fact that we are facing something that's like a point of no return, okay? The system is going to really have serious problem, and yet, COP climate change 2015 in Paris, we have achieved really very little. All of those data that have been put on the table and analyzed and used to devise model and prediction and uh, possible solutions uh, have not really managed to break the walls of other type of problem, which are perception, need to force policies, uh, the need to keep the public happy by not tightening, for example, or lowering our uh, access uh, to uh, fuels and, and so on. So I leave it open because I think that the question about how we cope with possible solution coming from a huge data analysis is one of the biggest uh, issues we have to face. And I will close just saying that I really wish that we take the opportunity of this further breakthrough from this really exciting time of developing a new technology with a very uh, mature way of not announcing and expecting the solution for all of our problems, not repeating the same narrative we have seen in the past decades, but being very open to many different types of possible applications, maybe many of them we don't even know what they will be in the coming years, and being very open to the fact that we really have to have a much more complex way of looking at how we work and how we can solve really problems. Thank you so much. Thank you.